people see my slides? Okay, great. So um, the uh, work that I'm presenting today was just published earlier this year. Uh, the lead author of the work is Sandra Visser, um, and uh, a lot of work has also been contributed by Bhargava Kangala, Craig Fancourt, and Alex Krug. Um, and what I really want to highlight today are, I said I'd talk about some of the open questions in the application of modeling. Um, Model-informed drug development is something that is uh, very it, in, in a lot of active discussion right now with FDA, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, I'll uh, present the work in the context of um, some modeling that we did to support the development of a smart insulin. Uh, I always uh, run out of time, so I wanted to upfront acknowledge that this was a large team. I'm only showing you a part of the team that was involved. Uh, the Glucose Responsive Insulin Discovery Team, experimental and chemists, experimental biologists and chemists. Uh, we collaborated with um, the University of Virginia, uh, as well as some internal folks, most notably uh, Mark Breton, who's uh, at the University of Virginia. And we also collaborated with a company uh, called QFarmetra on the model-based meta-analysis, and I'll talk about what that actually is uh, in a second. Uh, so to uh, give kind of a background and make a, a provocative statement, um, the reason why we're really motivated to do this type of computational modeling in pharma is because we're in, working in a data-poor environment. Uh, I think uh, that is not what people think uh, is true of um, drug development, uh, but in fact, what happens is that in drug development, uh, we're working on an investigational therapeutic, and you really can't ask people um, to take the risk of uh, taking these drugs unless you're really certain that it's going to be safe and efficacious. And obviously, this is a stepwise process, and so. Um, we need to be able to use any available data to be able to move, uh, to risk, if you like, the investigational drug. And so what you see on the right is uh, a figure from a white paper from about 10 years ago um, by uh, Peter Sorger and Sandy eller Heiligen, uh, where uh, it was an NIH meeting to really coin the term quantitative systems pharmacology, where the focus now is on modeling the drug action. And uh, you can see that it's an integration of various types of data um, across the top, a horizontal, so-called horizontal integration of um, different, uh, different focuses that are more drug related. Are you acting at a specific molecular target, et cetera? And then on the vertical side, a biological um, axis, if you like, starting off with in vitro experiments, cell-based experiments, um, and moving up into the patient population clinical studies. And so we try to integrate all of these things, and I'll, I'll talk this through in uh, my example. Um, and I will note that the preclinical data is highly variable. Uh, and of course, how well any of these experiments models the human system, the human disease is up question. Um, additionally, how you normalize across these historical data, how you bring them together, how you impute, um, what uh, has not been well controlled from your perspective, uh, et cetera. Those are all major issues as we pull together these data. Um, and I want to reemphasize that our focus is in the modulation of a target um, as opposed to understanding overall biology. I think these are themes that have come up uh, in the SysMod sessions here at this meeting. So let me then turn to our, my example. Um, I hope this is another provocative statement to say that diabetes is an unmet need. Um, there was just a recent um, US Center for Disease Control study that was put out this year that um, talked about the prevalence of diabetes in the US population, which has increased from less than 5% to now 30 million people in the US. Um, and more notably, people who do have diabetes uh, don't control it very well. So this in 36.4% of diabetics, um, do they control their, a combination of glucose, cholesterol, and smoking? 36% um, excuse me, is um, 
the lower bar. In fact, there's a more stringent bar where 18% of diabetics actually meet that bar. So it's definitely uncontrolled. And why is it uncontrolled? Um, I mentioned that hypoglycemia is a serious consequence of overdosing, if you like, on, on the current treatments. And uh, for fear of hypoglycemia, often uh, people back off of their glucose control. So there is a, an unmet need here. Um, but there are a lot of treatments available. There um, are um, uh, increased understanding. We have not just drugs, of course, to treat uh, diabetes. And so not just for diabetes, but in general for, for diseases, it's a changing environment, constantly evolving. There's no fixed definition of any disease. And so um, hypoglycemia has currently been recognized as an important adverse consideration uh, during drug development. Um, what is also current is how we test in early testing um, glucose control. And the paradigm for that is something called the glucose clamp. It's a very complex clinical protocol, in fact. And um, it's done to protect uh, the volunteers from experiencing too large surges in their glucose, plasma glucose levels. Uh, and so um, that's the current paradigm for diabetes. Um, it's often changing, not just for diabetes, but for other areas. So I mentioned this as an underlying issue and that needs consideration uh, in a practical context like this. So the way that we've approached this then is to modify insulin by adding a carbohydrate moiety. And so that's the little hexagonal, that two octagonal um, uh, object that's shown on the insulin in the cent upper center of my diagram. And I'll just let me just change my pointer laser pointer. So here you can see, if you, if you can see my laser pointer, uh, the insulin carbohydrate conjugate. This is our glucose responsive insulin. And the reason it's glucose responsive is that this moiety is cleared through the glucose receptor, through a mannose receptor. And so uh, if it's competing for glucose, which is shown in as these little circles, uh, when your plasma glucose is low, you're at risk for hypoglycemia. That's the adverse event. And in that case, the insulin conjugate is actually just cleared uh, because there's no glucose competing for this particular clearance, if you like, clearance receptor. Um, but when you do have high plasma glucose and you need the insulin action, then, then it sticks around and does its thing. So that's the essential underlying mechanistic hypothesis for our compound. So what do we know? Um, we have not measured when I'm talking about this work. We haven't really measured it in people just yet, uh, but we have measured our new drug, um, our test substance in animals. And so we do have some animal data, um, but it, it's complicated. So let me just uh, kind of break this down for you, the type of data that we do have. So uh, these two axes uh, distinguish animal and human data. And this uh, horizontal axis uh, separates the dynamic behavior of insulin from the ins uh, glucose clamps that I mentioned, and I'll say more about it just in a second. Um, you would think there's a ton of literature data, it's insulin and glucose after all, um, and I'll show you on the next slide um, what we know about insulin versus glucose. But to um, focus how we approach this, then we want to focus on these specific questions. We want to focus on what is the relationship between insulin and plasma glucose glucose dynamically so that we can predict when it's clamped. Um, what's different about our glucose responsive insulin and how glucose responsive does it have to be quantitatively to be effective? Um, and thirdly, um, because we measured it in animals and not humans, does that translate well what we've measured in animals and can we use that to plan our clinical experiments? So the, that's the focus of uh, the work. Um, and I just want to spend a second on the CLAMP protocol. This is the clinical protocol that we've modeled in the animal and, of course, then plan the clinical experiments. Um, we are going to infuse both glucose and insulin. Um, we've, we've, we try to infuse glucose to get a, a steady state glucose level in the plasma. For the insulin, we're going to start infusing it. And so this is what you see this ramp up 
Um, and uh, that will change the amount of glucose being um, being used, if you like. Um, and uh, that means that you'll have to infuse more glucose to be able to clamp it. And so the glucose infusion rate is an is a marker for, is a surrogate for how effective your insulin is. And the um, insulin infusion rate is your dosing for this type of experiment. So um, what uh, I've shown here is that once you start infusing that insulin, you're gonna start clamping your glucose level. Uh, when you stop infusing it, it obviously will drop, the insulin level will drop. And so what happens with our smart insulin, our glucose responsive insulin, is that you get uh, less of a drop or more of a drop, depending on how we set up this experiment. Um, I hope that will become clearer as we talk through the experiment. One more thing I wanted to mention is that um, normoglycemia or euglycemia is usually somewhere between 75 to 90 milligrams per deciliter glucose in the plasma. Uh, moderate hypoglycemia, like after a meal, would be about 200 milligrams per deciliter, and um, severe hypoglycemia would be spiking over that, possibly up to 300 or higher. Okay, so approach first uh, is to look at the data that we have uh, in the literature. Um, what we did here was actually use um, uh, uh, a literature search approach, we attempted to start with natural language processing and then actually had to read a bunch of papers. Uh, the surprising thing to note is, again, we're talking about insulin and glucose, recombinant human insulin experiments, clinical experiments. The number of papers that we found that had relevant data were only 21, which, um, which was a surprisingly low number, if you ask me. Um, and uh, this Part of the modeling that I'm not going to do proper justice to was performed by Eric Burroughs and Craig Fancourt. They actually use an existing um, sigmoidal model for the relationship between insulin and glucose. And um, the I would call this piece of work a more parameter tuning and sensitivity analysis. Uh, and um, it started with published parameters and, uh, and simply tuned them to the, to the human parameters uh, that uh, was, were found in the literature. And what happens with this model is that on the lower left here, you can see that we consider this to be PK. This is a measure of steady state insulin uh, in these, in these uh, study arms. The study arms are indicated by these uh, symbols, blue meaning healthy patients, a red meeting type 1 diabetic patients, and the number of patients per arm is indicated by the size of the symbol. You can see that the observations fall within a 90% prediction interval of the model, and so it predicts well. Over on the right is now what we would call the pharmacodynamic, which is the disposal rate of glucose, how much glucose you have to infuse in uh, to keep that glucose level uh, clamped. And um, you can see here that, again, the model describes the trend of the data. It doesn't seem to capture everything, but there's a wide variability. So we thought this was an acceptable uh, model to move forward with. Okay, so the main point that I wanna make here to generalize to other um, uh, simulation, modeling and simulation approaches is that um, we, this piece of work is to support the program, the mechanistic hypothesis. So whatever, new approach one takes biologically to for drug treatment, for modifying a disease. Um, these approaches really can do a lot to quantitatively support the hypothesis. And moreover, when we're quantitative and predictive, we can extrapolate outside of what's been tested. We can extrapolate to other um, more extreme hyperglycemic conditions. We can actually modulate the potency, predict what the effect of a modulated potency would be. And in our case of an increased clearance at euglycemia versus hyperglycemia. So we want faster clearance at euglycemia, no difference at hyperglycemia. That's what the smartness of the insulin does. Uh, so we can now model these hypothesized effects and predict. 
once we have a basis for the, uh, for the relationship. Okay, that's the first piece of modeling I just wanted to fly through at a high level. Next, uh, we want to translate from the animal because we haven't me measured uh, the effect of our drug in people yet. Um, and um, we want to know if the effect that we're seeing in the animal should translate well. So we use a very standard uh, approach to what's called pharmacokinetic modeling. That is to say, we're modeling the dynamics of the drug effect. We know that the drug disperses to the body, it's absorbed into certain blood compartments, into various tissues. And so uh, there's kind of a semi-empirical, um, semi I would say, description of the distribution of drug. And we estimate, we simultaneously, we fix some of those parameters that we, we are relatively confident in, uh, and we estimate the other parameters using nonlinear mixed effects modeling. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more about it. It's a very standard pharmacokinetic approach. Happy to answer questions at the end. What we do with that is we now have some parameters like volume of distributions, like blood volume. And we know that we can just, um, we can just scale that from the animal system. And in our case, we're modeling both the mini pig data and dog data. We can just translate based on the blood volume of those animals versus human, uh, what we would expect these semi-empirical parameters to be in human, and then we can predict things about clearance and uh, insulin, et cetera. So that's what's shown over on the right. We are able to predict uh, human clearance, human insulin levels, et cetera. So the main point here is to estimate something that is um, measurable or conceptually valid for pharmacology, and that allows us then to do the human dose projection. There are obviously other ways of doing this as well, the human dose projection. Um, it's a major um, problem for every, for every development program. All right, so how else can we approach this question now and think about um, clinical variability? So we took a second approach to understanding the insulin glucose relationship that was less mechanistic um, here, uh, we're using a, what, a algorithm from something called the closed loop artificial pancreas system. And I'm sorry to be going through this so quickly, but this could be a talk, many talks all on its own. Uh, but the concept here is it's a three element device. It is actually, uh, it has been in clinical development for a few years. I know that there was a, a device that was going to be commercially available imminently. I don't know if it is yet. Uh, but um, we don't develop it, other people develop it. So the elements are, first of all, um, a, that you need an algorithm to interpret data that's collected by a glucose sensor on, um, on the skin, and then it tells a, an insulin pump that uh, the individual carries around how much insulin to give on a few minute, incre few minute increment. Uh, so the key piece for us is this algorithm that um, tells the pump how much insulin to give in, in what bolus. One approach is to use what's probably more of a control engineering approach that's based on changes in glucose, and it'll uh, tell the um, pump how much insulin to, uh, to give to control that. Um, the one that we were interested in was a model predictive controller, and you can see over here, I hope you can see um, what this model looks like. That's, this is an old version of the structure. It has undergone quite a bit of revision. Um, obviously, it has to be um, fast to be able to give real-time predictions of insulin level that's needed. Um, and it's been validated uh, and accepted by the FDA in lieu of, um, of uh, various types of testing for these types of devices uh, by the FDA. And the key piece of the validation is that it reproduces the variability that's observed in clinical populations, um, in type one patients, adults, and children. And so uh, being able to describe the, the, the range of variation that's seen in people over a 24 hour time period is really the key for this algorithm and uh, the key for us wanting to use this approach to then predict what we would be seeing in um, a real population. 
So the question now is, first, naively, um, if we did get the same translation from the animal to the human, was, is that good enough? So our, in our hands, our uh, compound, it's called MK2640, it is 30% glucose responsive, meaning it has the same clearance as insulin at when it's needed uh, for it, 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 concentration is the same as insulin when it's needed. When the uh, plasma glucose drops to euglycemia, then we get 30% more clearance of this uh, compared to regular insulin. So you have uh, reduced risk of hypoglycemia. So what we wanted to model was, um, first of all, for recombinant human insulin over a 24 hour time period where an individual or a group of individuals, because you can see the whole envelope here of glucose response, um, when they take breakfast, lunch, and then dinner, they take a, an insulin, prandial insulin bolus just before each meal to control their peak of glucose. And uh, our simulation says they took a little bit too much before dinner, and so half of them actually experience hypoglycemia. So they fall below this red dotted line, uh, which is 75 milligrams per deciliter of, um, of blood glucose, and that's a hypoglycemic event. So we just then simulated naively to say what happens if we get a 30% increased clearance at euglycemia, and you can see the simulation, again, naively shows that uh, nobody would experience hypoglycemia. So that also is a, a nice uh, support for, the, for our program to say, we're in um, a ballpark where we can really work with our compound. So again, uh, the modeling here, another approach to modeling is to support the mechanistic hypothesis um, to say going forward, we're, we're pretty, we think we're okay. Um, but more importantly, there's a train going by. Uh, more importantly, we're now going to give our colleagues specific targets that we want to hit. In our, in our clinical study design. And we're gonna use this model and the first model that I told you about to try to predict out what would happen in a clinical trial. So that means that we wanna now design the glucose clamp study. Um, the, if a, the glucose clamp protocol is complex, it's dynamic um, in the sense that you have to pick an infusion rate for your glucose and your insulin that's going to clamp your glucose level. There's a lot of moving parts to it. And so the simulation is extremely helpful for a number of reasons. Uh, the first is that, um, as I mentioned, because you've got two um, key elements that you're trying to control, um, we need to know where to start. Um, when we know that our modified insulin may have a different potency than regular human insulin, um, and uh, we know that it has a different clearance depending on what glucose level you're trying to clamp at. So those things make um, the design actually quite difficult, and it's already a difficult clinical uh, paradigm to, for the investigators. Um, we want to ask questions like, we want our control arm of insulin versus our modified insulin uh, to have the same effect at some clamp level. That could be at euglycemia, that could be at hyperglycemia. So we did a bunch of simulations to say we'll see a, the biggest effect if we match at euglycemia. I hope that made sense. Um, so the dose matching we determined should be at euglycemia. Um, and so we wanted to understand how to clamp, how much, what rate of glucose and insulin to infuse, um, and uh, looking at the variability that we would expect to, um, sorry, that this is all so small, uh, but um, they're showing healthy volunteers versus diabetics for different types of, we're going to clamp at euglycemia, move up to hyperglycemia, move down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're running a bunch of simulations to predict what that trace is going to look like for all the individuals at um, different clamp levels. And so the different colors, more or less, describe different clamp levels. There's time across the bottom. We're asking people to sit in the chair for nine hours um, 
hooked up to these uh, pumps. So um, we better get it right uh, at the outset and not, not ask them to come back. Um, and so given all of that, what is the variability that we could observe and therefore how many people do we need in each of these study arms? So those are the key questions that we were trying to address using the class. Um, and um, again, long story short, and I would direct you to um, a paper by Alex Krug and colleagues that was published last year that describes this uh, ex clinical experiment. Uh, we sh showed, first of all, that at three different clamp levels, this is euglycemia, hy hyperglycemia, and massively hyperglycemia. Um, what's shown in the plot is the 90% prediction interval uh, from the model and the observed levels of, uh, of um, this is glucose disposal, if you like. Um, that's a pharmacodynamic effect or uh, insulin effect. Um, that the insulin effect was reasonably well predicted and for regular insulin. So that gives us confidence going into the next stage of the clinical experiment, which is to look now at our MK2640. So we did see um, that, uh, actually I'll direct your attention to this plot of um, human insulin versus our drug. You can see that there's an expected, we would predict in the, in the solid line that there's a shift to the right in the um, amount of drug that's needed to get an effect because we've got a fast clearance at euglycemia. Uh, so you need more drug. We also have a difference in potency for our drug. Uh, so um, this right shift that we predicted in the solid lines actually was a little more extreme. We over predicted um, how much worse we would be than regular insulin. Um, so you can see the observed uh, data in the circles. Uh, we actually had a, a, a stronger effect of our glucose responsive insulin than expected. So we did observe a 44% glucose responsive insulin effect. Uh, which is we weren't expect we were expecting something like a 25 to 30 percent, so that was actually better than we anticipated. We didn't actually though see a difference in the level of steady state insulin that we were expecting to see. Um, and I, as I mentioned just now, the insulin activity of our modified insulin uh, was underestimated. So um, unfortunately for our program, because of this massive clearance at euglycemia and the fact that we didn't have a pass forward for increasing the potency of our conjugate, um, that was going to be a problem for developing this um, insulin. We were going to have to pump in a lot more of our modified insulin than a, a patient would have to take normally. So that wasn't, and we didn't really have a way uh, around that. So uh, this program is no longer being developed. But it was not just a lack of trying. And um, in fact, I think the modeling here really um, helped design a complex experiment. So what I think I wanted to um, highlight here is that the FDA has actually started um, a model-informed drug development uh, discussion with people who are working in this area. and. Um, there is something called the uh, Prescription Drug User Fee Act. So it's an act, uh, it's a law called FDUFA. And we're now on, I think, the sixth version of it. And that was passed a couple of years ago. And it is the FDA's commitment to now look at model, amongst other things, model informed drug discovery development uh, to um, see how we might be able to use these types of simulated data in lieu of data that could be observed clinically. Sometimes it's just impossible. For example, like in a pediatric study, the FDA would like a lot more pediatric data to be made available, but that's really not possible in some cases to, to generate. People are not going to place their children in a clinical trial. So um, the FDA is, is looking for um, how much trust we have in these model-based approaches and how they can be used for drug development programs. And so they're having a pilot set of discussions currently with uh, various folks to see um, how confident these model, we are in these models. And I would say that you'll see a, a definitely a, an uptick uh, in the acceptance by FDA 
of these types of um, model data in future, I think there's uh, definitely an appetite to be able to do this. Uh, the other thing that I really wanted to emphasize here is that uh, the ability to bring all of these data that I've talked about together has really been about dynamics. And that's because of the problem at hand. We understand that insulin and glucose control uh, is a highly dynamic process. So most of what everything that I've presented to you today has really been about dynamics. Um, and that's more or less true, I would say, for a lot of drug discovery programs because we need to know what happens when, roughly. Um, and so it is uh, a more difficult when we're talking about uh, molecular biology data, profiling data, to have longitudinal data. Now, that being said, I think uh, we're doing a lot uh, to, to look at longitudinal analyses of omics data. We're looking at multi-layered data where not every layer may have dynamics to it, um, but um, I think there are a lot of really interesting approaches that are being taken right now to, to include dynamics uh, in more traditional systems biology approaches. So what I wanted to summarize, uh, the main points that I wanted to, to make about the utility of quantitative systems biology and drug development are these. So the first is that we're very much focused on therapeutic modulation of target. What that means is often, if not always, that we want to describe some kind of dynamic around target modulation. Uh, and the reason for that is because the, we're giving a pill once a day, it's going to knock down our target um, below maybe some threshold for like an hour or two every day. Um, so how does, how does that kind of dynamics affect target modulation? If I give an injection of um, a biologic once every six weeks, and uh, how does the recovery of whatever my target was for this biologic, um, how does the dynamics of that recovery affect the therapeutic modulation of the target? Um, so those, are, those questions of dynamics are really critical to understanding, uh, to the application of modeling to drug development. Um, I mentioned that if we can't measure everything dynamically, there are some things that we know we can measure longitudinally. And so how can we tie those longitudinal markers to a larger data set? Or can we understand um, the, if not longitudinal, can we understand our um, system under a series of different perturbations. And that will really help triangulate how we need to validate, how we need to plan for our set, next set of experiments. Um, I think w there's been some talks in this, uh, in this track about human dose projection. That's a continuing issue. And um, I think I've talked about how these approaches uh, help determine efficacy. I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I like to ask the audience if there are direct questions. So far, there are none in the question box, but maybe someone wants to directly raise their hand. I think I probably uh, went a little too quickly over some of the most interesting details of those models. Um, if not, I, I would like to um, ask a question about the use of um, standards such, a, such as SBML and so forth. Are they being used in industry actually? Um, and what is your opinion about those? Uh, yeah, they, they are actually, um, and especially for porting um, existing models. I would say that um, the problem of parameterization is a continuing one. And uh, often when we uh, attempt to, um, to reuse published models, it does take some time for that reason. There's often um, some tweaking that needs 
uh, to be done, and uh, one almost never is able to reproduce published uh, plots um, on the first go. So, uh, but we do do use um, those types of standards, um, and uh, for us, it varies uh, depending on which group you're talking to. We, we use also some code sharing like Bitbucket uh, to, to actually develop codes together. Thank you. That's uh, very good to know. Now, um, Osman Yogotku, I hope I pronounced correctly the name, asked a question and he says, thank you. How could we introduce the potential impact of immunogenicity of insulin products into your existing model? Yeah, that's that's a, a great question. And in fact, um, uh, for that was feedback for our clinical study that we were um, required, of course, to monitor immunogenicity. And um, uh, because it was a crossover study, we actually had to determine if there was immunogenicity in some of our uh, subjects, and um, if uh, we had to set a, a threshold for which uh, subjects would be asked not to continue um, for the repeat arms for our study. And uh, that's always very difficult to determine. So uh, we have, we didn't include it in this model. We've um, tried to model immunogenicity in a number of different ways. Um, if we're talking about uh, design of peptides, design of antibodies, um, there are a number of prediction algorithms for immunogenicity of certain protein sequences, for example. So we do use, actually we have a dedicated group who does that kind of modeling. Uh, but in terms of uh, general production of anti-drug antibodies, um, we tend to use we tend to try to project off of in vitro data. Uh, we often cannot use animal data in that context because um, the molecules that we're developing are humanized molecules and obviously don't have the same immunogenicity in animals. So we often go back to first principles and translational, uh, the, the translation of the proteins and antibodies themselves and sometimes try to model um, the antibody maturation dynamics, um, but I would say that it, it's, uh, it's more of an arch than a science at this point. Omar Selika seems to have a question. Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Carolyn. Um, related to Andreas's uh, first question, uh, what opportunities are there for academia to work more closely with the pharmaceutical industry in the field of systems biology and systems modeling? What, what do you need from academicians? What, how can we help? I would say that um, up till fairly recently, well, it, it, it's kind of come in waves. And for example, Merck. Uh, Merck bought um, um, engine now was it? It bought a company in Seattle many years ago that was a systems biology company and uh, tried to bring some of those molecular profiling approaches in-house. Um, and then there was a wave where that went away and now we're coming back again. So um, whether companies invest a lot to, to generate those data in-house um, is a pendulum. Uh, and I would say that a lot of collaborations in the systems biology area really kind of focus a little bit more on the access to large data sets and large clinical samples. Um, the um, new trend is that, especially in the microbiome area, where we, where a lot of the, where a lot of the analyses are still being explored and being developed. There are a number of collaborations that um, I've seen with academia in that space. Um, and then the integration of methods, um, that's something that we haven't been able to apply um, in a while. I would say that how we use molecular profiling data to help programs 
has always been um, very exploratory and they haven't really been able to say, you need to do this, you need to check this, and uh, otherwise your program is not going to work. Uh, so we're, we are there now. And um, so I would say that um, at least at Merck, we are we are working with a couple of academic groups in particular to integrate um, the microbiome. But um, uh, as we as we are increasingly turning, as the industry is increasingly turning to uh, molecular profiling, I would say that those those collaborations, you know, I think people will be reaching out uh, in, from industry to to the academic world. Um, yeah, so um, I, I would say it's more industry's fault that uh, you know a lot of discovery efforts and early development efforts have not been really invested in that heavily because they're high risk, and um, that certainly is not true at Merck um, now. And I think that a lot of companies are actually investing more into their discovery than they have been. But there was a long period there where I think companies were not 